To celebrate hitting 25,000 subscribers and to celebrate the end of the year, from now until the end of 2021, head on over to JG9Shop.com and use the promo code JG92021 for 10% off your order. That's JG92021. We have over 100 products on the store, ranging from t-shirts to hoodies to mugs, so there's something for everyone. Go to JG9Shop.com for your end of the year holiday purchases. And now, on with our feature presentation. When you really dive into it, it's kind of amazing how the Seattle Seahawks went 8-8 eight eight during the 1985 season. It's almost a minor miracle that Chuck Knox was able to get the team to finish the year without a losing record. Because my god, were they a dysfunctional organization that made poor roster decision after poor roster decision. If you were to pinpoint a bad decision, odds are, most Seahawks fans would point to the entire 1985 draft class, where they had 12 picks, and just one of them was on the team in 1986. They had no first round pick, they cut their second round pick before he even played a game, and cut their third round receiver who gave him a career stat line of two receptions for 10 yards. Just putrid all the way around. But as bad as that was, this moment might highlight that dysfunction a bit more. Because in 1985, being the punter of the Seattle Seahawks gave you about as much job security as a Game of Thrones character. During the first month of the season, the Seahawks created an absolute circus out of their punter position, with revolving doors spinning faster than the rotation of the Earth. When all was said and done, by the time the first month of the season was over, the Seahawks had changed punters not once, not twice, not three times, but four times, and the manner in which they did it was borderline hysterical and absolutely incompetent. And this is the story behind the incredibly bizarre saga. Before I talk about the 1985 season and how the Seahawks handled their punting situation, we need some context to understand why the Seahawks were in this position to begin with, as well as the two punters fighting for their job. Our story begins with a man named Jeff West. The Cincinnati punter was drafted by the local NFL team, the Cincinnati Bengals, in the fifth round of the 1975 NFL Draft, but he never actually played it down for Cincinnati. He found his way on the St. Louis Cardinals that season before playing four seasons with the San Diego Chargers where he had a 1976 season where he finished 7th in the league in yards per punt. By 1981, he was on the Seattle Seahawks, and in 1984, he was entering his fourth season with the team, switching from one AFC West team to another. There was just one small tiny problem. Jeff West was kinda bad. You'd be hard pressed to find too many punters in football who were worse than West during the 1984 season. He had no power in his leg whatsoever. There were a ton of punts that were just wounded duck shot out of the sky, and you're looking at some of them right now. The only time he had power was when he was trying not to boot it into the end zone, and inevitably getting a touchback and having Chuck Knox question his life choices about why he didn't try and go for it if the result was just a 10 or 15 yard difference because of how bad West was. That season, West averaged a mere 37.5 yards per punt, which was dead last in the NFL by an entire yard. This was at a time where the league average was 42 yards, and here was West, ranking roughly 5 yards below the league average, and finishing 30th amongst all qualified punters in a league with 28 teams. The Seahawks were a great team in 1984. They went 12-4, finishing with what was easily their best record in franchise history, and they made it all the way to the divisional round. But it was clear that the punting game was a major weakness of theirs. If they were going to have similar success in 1985, they were going to need a punter who wasn't a liability and could actually flip the field. During the 1985 offseason, they brought in former Denver Broncos and New England Patriots punter Luke Prestridge as a free agent but he didn't stick around, and wouldn't kick in the NFL again after that 1984 season. However, it would be the next man that they brought in that would change everything. That man was a man from good old Rocky Top, Rocky Top, Tennessee. The Colquitt family has sent four punters to the professional level. Craig Colquitt punted for seven seasons, and won two Super Bowls with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Britton Colquitt punted for 11 seasons, and won a Super Bowl with the Denver Broncos. Dustin Colquitt has spent 17 seasons in the league, made two Pro Bowls, and won a Super Bowl with the Kansas City Chiefs. And then, there's this guy right here. Many consider him to be the greatest punter in the history of the Tennessee Volunteers. His name was Jimmy Colquitt, and there were very few punters in college football that were better than he was. Throughout the first half of the 1980s, any time Tennessee had to punt, you could count on Jimmy Colquitt to flip the field, or pin the opposition deep without booting it into the end zone. He was Tennessee's starting punter for four consecutive seasons, and averaged at least 42 yards per punt in all four seasons. In 1982, Colquitt averaged an incredible 46.9 yards per punt, which if placed in the NFL that season, would have led the league by two yards. He was named a second-team All-SEC member as a freshman and a sophomore, and was named an All-American selection twice in 1982 and 1983. By the time his collegiate career was done, he averaged 43.9 yards per punt, which was the highest average in the history of the Tennessee football program. Safe to say, Colquitt was a really good collegiate punter 
who seemed like he was going to have a promising future in the NFL. Which is why it was kind of shocking when during the NFL draft, there were five hunters taken, and not a single one of them was named Jimmy Colquitt. Still, despite the disappointment of not being one of the 335 players here his name called, on the two days that the draft was being held at the New York Sheraton, he was able to find his way into the league, signing with the New York Giants as an undrafted free agent. However, Colquitt didn't win the punting job, losing it to Sean Landetta. Safe to say, the Giants made the right call in that department, as Landetta would last all the way until 2005, would play nine seasons in New York, and would make two Pro Bowls. Still, Colquitt's NFL dream was not done just yet, because with Jeff West struggling, Seattle brought Colquitt in for a punting competition, and the winner of the competition was the undrafted rookie, who beat out the struggling veteran. Jimmy Colquitt was the new punter of the Seattle Seahawks. If only it was that easy. It seemed like everything was under control now, right? The Seahawks were able to find a replacement for West, since he was never really very good and was only getting worse, and they got a punter that seemed promising on paper, and a punter that, while he wasn't able to beat out Landetta with the Giants, was able to outlast Dave Jennings, a four-time Pro Bowl punter widely regarded as one of the best punters around the turn of the decade. That had to be worth something, right? Colquitt had accomplished his dream and was now one of just 28 starting punters in the NFL. There's no way he could mess this up, right? Well, that's where things go haywire, because in their preseason game against the San Francisco 49ers, which was Colquitt's first game as the team's starting punter, he was atrocious. Unfortunately, there's no footage available of this game, because I don't know why there'd be any footage lying around of a 1985 preseason game between the Seahawks and the 49ers, but nothing about this performance was pretty. He averaged less than 30 yards per punt, had trouble handling a few snaps, and even had one abysmal punt that went three yards. That's right, a three-yard punt. And this wasn't like the four-yard punt that the Chicago Bears executed in a 1993 Thanksgiving game against the Detroit Lions, which was genuinely an amazing play by the punter that you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. From all indications, this was just an awful punt. After one game, Knox realized that he couldn't trust Colquitt. He released Jeff West to bring on Jimmy Colquitt, and even though West was terrible, with a poor yards per punt average and minimal hang time, somehow, Colquitt seemed to be even worse. Knox realized that he made a mistake. And not even one week after the game, Knox made another punting change, releasing Jimmy Colquitt. So who was Knox going to bring in as the punter? For some reason, he decided that now was a great time to bring back Jeff West. That's right, the worst punter in football the year before, the man who was only getting worse, and the man that the Seahawks just cut a few days ago, was being brought back into the fold. To the shock of absolutely no one, this did not work out at all. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And I guess the Seahawks were insane for expecting this stint by Jeff West to go any differently than the last one. It's hard to think of too many justifications for bringing back the guy you just cut that was the worst punter in the league the year before, but Seattle apparently thought of some because West was back. And he was not good at all. Over those first two games, he averaged a mere 38 yards per punt. He had three touchbacks and could not pin the ball inside the 20 at all. These touchbacks were coming near midfield and in opposing territory, with one touchback even coming from the opposition's 35-yard line, which comes out to a net punt of 15 yards. After two weeks, Knox realized that this was not going to work, and that bringing back West was a mistake. When Knox brought West back at the start of the regular season, he said that the punting job was his until he lost it. And I guess after two abysmal performances, even though the Seahawks won both of those games to start the season 2-0, he lost it. So with that in mind, the Seahawks needed a new punter. You had some free agents down on the market. You had some guys off the street that could punt a football. You had some specialists, especially those displaced from the USFL, that were around and could potentially help the team out. Guess who the Seahawks decided to sign? You're never gonna believe it. They re-signed Jimmy freaking Colquitt. It's like the Seahawks only had the yellow pages and phone book for two punters in the entire universe. Let me get this straight. In the span of less than a month, the Seahawks cut West to have Colquitt be the starter then decided to cut Colquitt to have West be the starter, then decided to cut West to have Colquitt be the starter. For a team to change their mind that many times about the same two players, and to keep rotating them in and out of a roster spot, was absolutely mind-boggling. I could call this whole mess a revolving door, but that would be an insult to revolving doors. The Seahawks changed punters three times in the span of less than a month, and did it with the same two punters, expecting things would be different. And unsurprisingly, when they brought Jimmy Colquitt back, shocker, it did not work at all. He was cut early in the 
the season after he mishandled a couple of punts against the 49ers in preseason. Kicked one three yards, the other 16 yards. They let it go, kept Jeff West. West was averaging net at about 28 yards, so they cut West. They brought Colquitt back. Jimmy Colquitt was not very good in his time with the Seahawks. While it went better than the preseason game against the 49ers, because that's an extremely low bar to clear, it was not pretty. He averaged slightly over 40 yards per punt, including but not limited to a punt of 22 yards on Monday Night Football against the Los Angeles Rams, a punt that went a net of 25 yards against the Kansas City Chiefs, a punt that went for a net of 19 yards that was a touchback from Kansas City's 39-yard line, and a punt that went for 27 yards. Colquitt was not much better than West was, if there was even any difference at all. And after just two games, the Seahawks made another punting change and decided to cut Colquitt. I think the football world was shocked that the undrafted punter that they cut three weeks before for not being good did not, in fact, turn out to be a good punter. Finally, after all this madness, someone finally alerted Chuck Knox and general manager Mike McCormack to the fact that you could sign punters that don't have the last name of Wester Colquitt. After this revelation, finally, finally, the Seahawks got some fresh blood in there, signing Dave Finzer, who would be their punter for the remainder of the season. So just to recap how this entire saga played out, the Seahawks had the worst punter in football and brought in a rookie punter for competition. The rookie punter wins the job over the worst punter, only for the rookie punter to have a poor game and get replaced one week later by the worst punter, only for the worst punter to have two poor games to start the season off and get replaced by the rookie punter, only for the rookie punter to also have two poor games and get replaced by a completely different punter. Got all of that? Got all those punting roster changes that took place in the span of about a month? If you did, then congratulations. You just rode what might just be the craziest punting carousel in the history of the National Football League. Get your official Jaguar Gamer 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes, link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed out to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar Gamer 9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.